Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. For Okay, so for case 14, uh, do you feel like it's better for the patient to be proactive and extract all teeth with ju- juvenile onset perio, or have you had good success w- with extracting affected teeth and doing routine cleanings along the way? Uh, Courtney, excellent question. Um, the answer to that is the first time that we see juvenile onset periodontitis varies considerably. Uh, we see it a lot in uh, young patients where you as the referring veterinarian have done the evaluation and you want to get a diagnosis that differentiates that from most of the time stomatitis. Most people aren't really uh, most veterinarians, unless they've had our, our courses or other similar courses, aren't really aware of the juvenile onset gingivitis uh, scenario. So that being said, back to juvenile onset periodontitis as a single entity, uh, when we see it initially, it's generally in a young patient. And when you talk to the owners, most of the time, you, you tell them that it's going to be an uphill battle from the, from now, even if the patient's six, seven months of age, it's going to be an uphill battle uh, for the rest of this cat's life. And it's probably going to require cleaning in the hospital every six uh, or every three to six months, uh, six to eight months at best, uh, if we're going to keep on top of this. And even then, when you're talking to clients, you need to let them know we still may uh, be losing teeth at each one of those cleaning episodes. So it makes sense uh, if that seems to be the progression of that individual case. If we get that patient in, we clean, at, let's say at seven months, and many times at seven months, we have multiple extractions, especially incisors in these guys. Then uh, on a recheck in three months, if we have additional bone loss, then that's generally a good indication that we need to extract everything. And the the reason why we kind of approach it that way is when we talk to owners in, in the past historically about extracting those uh, all those teeth uh, at once, they're very, very reluctant. They're just blown away by the recommendation to extract all those teeth in a young cat. Now, in stomatitis, there's no option. That is the recommendation. With with um, juvenile onset periodontitis, there is the option of watching these guys and seeing how they progress based on the individual. We have had uh, several patients along the way that uh, that have juvenile onset periodontitis uh, one in particular that I saw in general practice years ago that we would see every six to eight months and uh, sometimes every year, and we would clean, and most of the time we'd have to extract a, another tooth or so. But we, that was, that was a uh, long-standing client in, a, in my general practice, so I had a lot of follow-up with them over a long period of time. And so that exists where you have these guys that aren't that affected that don't progress really rapidly. And along with home care, uh, generally healthy mouth uh, and um, frequent frequent cleanings in the hospital, then uh, they can, in some cases, be maintained long term. Kyle, in K-16, we talk about using uh, inappropriate setting on electrosurgery unit for gingival hyperplasia. What is the appropriate setting if that's used rather than a burr? Uh, that, that, that setting is definitely not uh, electric artery. It is the setting that is recommended by 
the company based on your unit for cutting tissue and not cauterizing. You, you definitely want to, to look at instructional videos. I would imagine if it is a veterinary unit that's made for uh, uh, like loop biopsies, things like that, and it can be used in surgery. And we, I used to do that in general practice. I had an Elman uh, electrosurgery unit and we got uh, sterile disposable wands from our research uh, facility. And we use those for all surgeries. We'd use them for laparotomies. We'd use them for uh, whatever we were doing as well as for gingival hyperplasia. I haven't used that in years, so I have no idea what the setting for that Elman uh, Surgitron is, or if they even make those anymore. I'm sure they do, but if um, you need to check with the manufacturer of that unit, you need to watch a video. If they don't have a video, you need to find out, talk to someone about the settings on those, and you don't have a lot of time contact on that tissue. The, the other uh, thing that would be a, be a big issue with that would be if you if you had even a cutting setting with contact with that tissue for a long period of time such that it could burn uh, tissue and adjacent bone. You definitely do not want that that going on either. So you need to make sure of those settings uh, before before you actually use that. Cindy, nice question. How uh, should we do biopsies? Which uh, uh, biopsy punch your scalpel? Uh, or even Ron Jewers to take a piece, referring to Ron Jewers, I'm sure if you are dealing with bone uh, and how big of a section and x-ray as well. So uh, just in, in general, uh, we always want to take dental x-rays, uh, bottom line. Doesn't matter what we do. That's the first thing we do after we get that patient down and under anesthesia for any procedure uh, that we're doing where we're evaluating the oral cavity, whether it's, whether the patient's coming in for cleaning or whether the patient's coming in for one lesion that's visible, everything should be full, full mouth radiographs. If you're doing a follow up, on a case that you've done, say, four months ago, and you're rechecking an area that you did uh, a, a minor bone graft on for bone loss adjacent to a tooth, then obviously you don't need to take full mouth extraction or <laughs> full mouth radiographs for that, for that case, uh, but you do need to uh, radiograph the area to make sure that, that that's worked and to evaluate whether uh, or not it's it's going to uh, be be successful uh, long term, and also to evaluate uh, what the next time interval should be when you want that patient back. If there's inflammation there, uh, you would set you would you want it back three months again. Uh, if there's no inflammation, uh, then you could go back. You could go five to six months the next next uh, cleaning evaluation. Uh, but in general, that's that's kind of how you would approach that. Um, so in a biopsy, again, full mouth, uh, uh, full mouth radiographs on any case. And then for the biopsy itself, you don't have to get real fancy with this. A scalpel, in most cases, in a gingival mass that is involving the margin, uh, just take a piece of that mass. Generally, what we do is if, if, if it's not uh, grossly disfiguring at the margin, we usually just take the excision to what the normal gingival margin would be. So we, we look at the tooth and we say, okay, well, this is where the gum should be. Let's just take that little section off and then it'll look more like normal. And then once we decide what the, what the mass is, then we can take appropriate measures. And um, so you don't, you don't have to get real, real fancy with these. If it's a parietal mass, sometimes those are best taken with scissors uh, where you take a segment of that palatal mass uh, off with, with a scissor, uh, not necessarily there to take the whole thing unless it is something that you feel you're not going to do more harm on. I mean, if it's a huge palatal mass and it's probably very vascular, you just want to take an, a, a small uh, incision uh, with a with a scissor or otherwise, and send that off. That's going to be enough 
for the pathologist to make a call on, on that biopsy. You could use a, a punch, but if you're dealing with attached gingiva and marginal gingiva, that really wouldn't, wouldn't play a role there. I think scissors, scalpel, uh, are the best way to go. Sometimes uh, it's best not to biopsy if it's in an area back in the in the caudal pharynx and you feel that you're not comfortable biopsying that. By all means, uh, refer it for the specialist to biopsy. Unfortunately, that's another anesthesia because they're going to have to biopsy it and then they're going to have to get the patient back once they get the the answer. But above all, don't put yourself in a situation where <clears throat> you're not comfortable biopsying something, especially caudal uh, around the uh, tonsils, around the uh, caudal oral pharynx, around the soft palate, where you might have some, some vascular uh, invasion that's going to get you into trouble. So um, hope that hope that answers your question. Let me, if, and, and also, Cindy, with uh, Ron Jewers, you can definitely get bone but most of the time, unless you're in, in there and you see, you take radiographs and the tissue's not really affected, but the bone is, and you've got to go in there and you've got to get a biopsy from the bone because the tissue's probably not going to give you the answer, then you're probably going to have to do a, a, a flap. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to just take a cross-cut tapered fissure burr and make a little square uh, down into the area that you want to biopsy and then take a, an extraction forcep and kind of get up underneath that and leverage out that little section. And that should be plenty enough for the pathologist to make the diagnosis on it. I trust you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed providing it. If you would, do us a big favor and go to our iTunes page, post a rating and review and take a picture of that with your cell phone and then post it on our Facebook page and we'll send you the Instrument Use Essentials course. If you also look below, there is a link to two live trainings that we do. And one is on radiographic interpretation. The other is on killer tips for quicker extractions. If you have not been to those, register for the one that's coming up next and the link will be in the show notes on the website the vet dental show and we'll get you in and get you a 30 minute 40 minute overview of those topics that are really insightful and all take home and then we'll also give you an opportunity to get a great deal and some bonuses on those two courses that are online courses that span uh, five hours and seven hours. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you'll help us out uh, with the post on our Facebook group. And then as a little extra bonus for you, you've got that link down there. You can register if you haven't been to either one of those and enjoy all of that content uh, that we're going to give you on those two topics. So take care. We'll see you next week.